Well, welcome everyone to the University of Idaho, University of Wyoming Sheep and Goat webinar series. I'm one of your co-hosts, Whit Stewart, a sheep specialist with the University of Wyoming. Uh, also joining are the founding uh, hosts and, and co-hosts in this capacity today, Dr. Melinda Ellison, chief specialist at University of Idaho, and Carmen Wilmore, extension educator at University of Idaho. Um, we are really excited for today's webinar, and I think everyone else is as well, gauging our participation to hear from Dr. Brett Taylor. Uh, it's a privilege to introduce Dr. Taylor uh, as a friend and colleague. Um, Dr. Taylor's been at the U.S. Sheep Experiment Station in Du Bois, Idaho, at, uh, uh, since 2002, uh, with degrees, graduate degrees from New Mexico State University and undergraduate degrees from West Texas A&M. Uh, Brett deserves a, a more thorough introduction, but suffice it to say that he is a huge advocate and asset for our industry in the Western United States. Uh, we work very closely with him in the land grant university system and the station is a huge resource for much of what we do. And without the U.S. Sheep Experiment Station, we would really be limited in what we can accomplish. So uh, not enough can be said about the contributions of this station historically, uh, but also um, in current times from their contributions. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over uh, to Dr. Taylor, who today is going to talk about functional shed lambing systems, infrastructure management, and health. So thank you, Dr. Taylor. I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you very much. It's uh... It's a pleasure. Well, I was I was about to say it's a pleasure to be here today with you, but um, with the pandemic uh, dilemmas that we're dealing with, I think that Dr. Stewart and Ellison, I mean, can attest to the fact that we miss being out there uh, with you guys. This is generally the time of year to where a lot of the conventions are held uh, throughout the West and the nation, and and uh, sometimes we're afforded the great opportunity or the great invitation to come talk in person with you, and, and we do miss that. So I guess uh, not being able to say it's a pleasure to be here, it's a pleasure to have this opportunity to speak with you. Um, uh, Dr. Ellison, thank you so much for the invitation, and my hat's off to her, and then later joining with WIT with this uh, webinar series that is that is frequent, and it's persistent, and it's a great resource. I, he, I just can't, uh, you know, encourage enough uh, participants uh, to continue uh, accessing these webinars um, uh, it's a great source of information. I found uh, some of them uh, 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 very uh, useful for myself as well. So it really doesn't matter what point you are at in the industry, uh, thinking about getting an industry in the industry, being in a service role of extension or research, uh, these webinars, webinar and this platform um, is, is a great uh, tool. So um, when Dr. Ellison first contacted me about this particular talk, uh, this talk actually, some of it was presented exactly about one year ago at the West Central States meeting uh, in Evanston, Wyoming. And it was uh, one of a four part series. I won't uh, burden you with the full four hours that it was originally presented, but we covered as much as we could. And, and, and actually Dr. Stewart was the one that pieced this uh, uh, t together for that particular forum was a very in-depth look at the shed lambing enterprise. So uh, Dr. Ellison had asked me to pull some of the infrastructure part as well as pull from the other talks and try to condense it into something more manageable for time-wise for this particular seminar. So I hope, I hope I've met that expectation and, and you guys can uh, benefit from this. Um, so really, first of all, when we, when we look at shed lambing enterprise, um, my assumption is, is the attendees that we have on this particular webinar will be those that maybe have already invested in this particular enterprise and those that are maybe considering it. So the, the shed lambing system that I'm talking about is in contrast to a very low infrastructure system, which would be a range or a pasture lambing scenario. And within the context of this talk, a, a, a shed lambing system with the way I'll, I will be talking, I, I was... You know, I developed this definition about a year ago, and I, you know, believe it or not, I kind of had to struggle a little bit with how do you define a shed lambing system? I mean, we certainly know that when we talk about range lambing or pasture lambing, there are a number of different variations uh, of that. And so we see the same on the shed lambing side as well. And so this is what I came up with because it's really down to there's one aspect um, that we want to accomplish in a shed lambing system. 
And that is, is we are pairing a ewe with the lambs that she will rear at the time of birth and in a sheltered environment to initiate husbandry practices for the sole purpose of increasing the probability that the lamb will survive to weaning. So there's three components of a shed lambing system that separates itself from the standard range or pasture lambing system. One is, is that you're individually going to pair a ewe at the time of birth or at the time of her offspring's birth or something that she has been grafted with. You're going to pair her with her lambs individually for a very brief period of time. So that's one aspect of a shed lambing system. The second one is that it is a sheltered environment. And there are a number of different variations when we look at sheltered environment. We'll talk about those in a minute. And the third thing is, is to initiate husbandry practices that are beyond what you are able to in a range or a pasture lambing environment. So you can see that those three things, individually pairing the ewe with her lamb, a sheltered environment, as well as an uptick in husbandry practices, those three things equal, hopefully, the ability to increase the probability that that lamb will survive through weaning and not just survive, that it will actually be a superior lamb in terms of growth and health compared with a hands-off range lambing enterprise. So those three things also tell you that you're going to be investing in infrastructure and you're going to be investing in labor. So it is a higher cost system. So Simply put, when we're out there in the actual uh, uh, sheep production field, all we're doing is, is we're just increasing our inputs in the first two weeks of a lamb's life in hopes that we can net more pounds of lamb to sell at the end of the year and that that is justified by get, having a good return on our investment. Now, people, shed lambing is not a novel concept. I would probably go to the mat and argue with any of you that perhaps the, if we could go back five to 8,000 years, I can't remember when the first domestication of sheep occurred, but if we could find that very first domesticated ewe, I would probably argue that it was shed managed in a shed lambing system. It could have been a tent covered with mammoth hides or, or, or maybe a cave, but I think when we try to envision or kind of imagine what it had been like, I mean, we certainly want to take this first domesticated ewe and keep her away from all the other wild critters, so why not throw her in the cave with us? But like I said, it's, it's not a normal concept, um, um, and it's just an intensification of, of, of care on that particular uh, birthing ewe and her offspring. But before we dive into it, we always have to consider that when we, are, when we are looking at our sheep production enterprise and what investments that we're gonna put into that particular enterprise, you know, the key thing is, is will the input result in a net output that will justify all of this cost or all of this increase in labor? And so, you know, we have to go back to financial management one-on-one -on -one, and we know that, that there is a threshold that, you know, we may want to do something and we may want to throw investment into that, but there's a threshold that we've got to continue to invest to get beyond to where we actually see a return uh, on our input. And so this graph here demonstrates that, and I have visited with a lot of uh, sheep producers that have, have um, been very interested in a lamb uh, uh, shed lambing enterprise or eat any other type of management that they may see in their system. And also I do some consulting on the cattle side. And a lot of times they will start to invest, but I get the comment, it's, it's just not working. I mean, I'm only seeing a little bit uh, of, of, of output. I mean, I'm only seeing a few more pounds weaned uh, 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 after I put this investment in, and I want to see a lot more to justify that cost. Well, we have this region to where, where it's simply, it may be, maybe you're not investing enough or maybe the way you're investing it is not really hitting it as it as it should. So we kind of call this area of, of minimal effect. Even though you're putting in the input, you're not receiving that output. And so this is what we are shooting for is, is to cross that threshold, not only in the amount that we, we, uh, we invest in the system, but also how we invest it in the system. Are we doing it properly? To finally reach that to where we actually see the return. We actually see the gain that we're shooting for, but also realize that there, there comes a point to where you are receiving good output for your level of input, but also we can reach a region of, of and this is for anything that you would invest in in life, we also reach a region to where 
Um, if a little, you know, we have kind of think, well, if a little bit's good, then a whole lot's great. Well, not necessarily all the time. That whole lot sometimes will actually carry us back into a region of diminishing return to where we're just not seeing the level of output anymore based upon our input. But like I talked about, when we look at a shed landing enterprise, those three factors I talked about are going to increase your cost. And therefore, that's why it's very important as you venture into this, or if you're already into a shed landing enterprise and you're looking to tweak it um, to become more efficient, is that threshold of profit. You may be in that optimal effect region. You may actually be reaping more pounds of lamb weaning, but still, mm, for some reason, our cost is still high enough that we're not being able to realize a profit with all of that uh, with all of that upfront investment in terms of cost and labor. So these are some of the things that you need to keep in mind as we go, go through this. And also when considering a shed lambing system, the evolution of a shed lambing system on your particular, um, in your particular uh, um, business, as far as sheep are concerned, you have to really consider it as just a part of a whole, of your whole enterprise. You know, if we look at it, you know, we have six weeks of lambing and that investment, will it be utilized for other things, the other, you know, 50, uh, you know, the other 40, 46 weeks of the year. And also realize that a lot of times producers are saying, yes, I want to increase the probability that my lambs will survive so I can see an increase in total of pounds weaned at weaning. But also, and, and, and they also think that maybe shed lambing is the way to go, but realize that there could be other limiting factors that although you increase the number of lambs coming out of lambing, that there could be a factor that's going to erode that away. Let's, let's, uh, I have a list here, location and climate, your resources year round, your feedstock availability, genetics, your marketing venues, a pre-existing infrastructure, labor and equipment availability. All of these factors, they actually could be the limiting factor, to whereas if you invest in a shed lambing system, you don't really see the level of output that you need for investing that. For example, let's talk about genetics. Is that if you have a breed type of sheep or just within a breed that your drop rate is only 120% and your uh, you know, weaning rate on average, if you're in a pasture system, is, is, is right at uh, 0.9 or maybe 1% on the average one lamb per ewe, and it's because of the genetics, um, a shed lambing system is not going to improve that. Okay, your limitation actually has to be with your genetics. The shed lambing systems are best applied to relatively prolific flocks where your drop rate is going to be up around 170 or 180 and better. Okay, so, so realize that just because you would invest in a shed lambing system doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to see the, the increase because you may have other factors that need to be addressed first before you move uh, to that. So anyway, those are just some thoughts on the side uh, in terms of, of making sure your investment is gonna go where you need it to go and it's gonna be managed accordingly to see the gains that you want. So let's talk about, actually the, the whole talk is gonna be based upon an example. So a shed lambing system example. So our reference flock that we're gonna use is a thousand ewes managed within a shed lambing system. Now. I know a lot of participants on these particular webinars are small flock producers, 10 to 100 head or something like that. Don't, because I said a thousand ewes, don't, don't let that turn you away from this particular talk because you may think, oh, well, he's just going to talk about large enterprises. No, not at all. The example that I'm going to use is actually the one that we use here at the U.S. Sheep Experiment Station. And actually the capacity of our shed landing facility is actually built for some 4,000 4, ewes. But the thing is, is the reason why this talk is applicable to all levels of producers from 10 lambs or 10 ewes to a 17,000 ewe enterprise is that all of the components of a shed lambing system are basically the same, no matter what size of your operation. Now, whereas if you have 10 ewes, you may be using a wheelbarrow to carry your feed. And for a thousand ewes, I may have a tractor pulling a, a feed wagon. Um, it's still delivering feed, it's just the level, and usually the larger the enterprise, the more automated or more mechanical that you would uh, get over just standard manual labor. So the deal is here is this talk does apply. All of the system components and all of the things that we'll talk about are the same regardless of the size of your, your enterprise. So anyway, let's go back to this 1000U uh, reference flock. The way that this reference flock is managed is those ewes would be busted up into two groups of 500 ewes apiece at breeding. 
Uh, group one would go in, let's say, October 14th, and group two would go in October 21st. They're exposed for 39 days, so our lambing is going to be again around March 9th with the, 9th with the first group. Um, in this system, ewes will drop or lamb. The word drop, when I say the word drop, that means lamb. Uh, the ewes will drop their lambs outside in holding pens, and as soon as that first lamb is noticed on the ground, uh, a drop picker, so that's a, a term that I'll use, that will be the person that's responsible for checking every 30 minutes, 24 hours a day, um, or the group of people, those drop pens and looking for the ewes that, that, that lamb, and they'll immediately pull that first lamb in the ewe inside into an individual jug, and then she will continue to finish lambing inside that jug. The lamb or the ewe with her lamb or lambs are isolated together in a, a jug. The jug is the term I'll use for the pen, and we'll talk about the size here in a little bit, for 24 to 48 hours. So it's an indoor facility in an individual pen called a jug. And they're going to be held there or, or held there for 20 to 48 hours. Then they'll be turned back outside to a larger lot or a pasture. And uh, they'll stay there for 35 days before they're turned out to a native range or to the open rangeland type management system that we that we do here in the Upper Mountain West. So that's that's a description of our reference flock. So also I want to talk about the lambing curve because the lambing curve is very important um, with um, with regard to how small or large your shed lambing facility is going to need. To be. So this one is an example based on a thousand U's of what I would expect. The red line, focus just on the red line for now, that's all of the U's together. And so this is day 70 of the year, so we're, we're looking at about March 9th, and we start out typical lambing curve where you got a few early lambers, then all of a sudden the, the uh, normal lambing uh, hits. And remember, we have about two peaks here. Uh, somebody may say three, but that's because there's polypase in there and they, they always make life interesting. Um, we have, there's five breeds actually represented in this entire curve, but really we're looking at two peaks and notice the peak on the average is about seven to 10 days apart and that corresponds with our breeding schedule. So really what we're looking at is the max number of ewes that I will have to deal with in any one day is about 65 over about a 14 day kind of peak peak lambing. So I'm running anywhere from about, you know, 50 up to 65 a day for that, that seven to 10 day, 10 day period. And so that tells me right there, basically how large my lambing, my shed lambing facility is going to need to be to accommodate all of these sheep. Now you can imagine that if this was a single breed, if this was, this was uh, all polypase, they were all exposed to the rams at the same time. Well, then I would have this very high peak, maybe up to where I would have to have the ability to hold 120 ewes lambing in a, a single day. So this just kind of introduces you to what we're going to talk about later in terms of the infrastructure and how we set this up and how we design it. Now I did throw in here these little green dots down at the bottom. This is your, this would be our ewe lambs. And they're always kind of a curveball. They're going to represent 15 to 20 percent of your flock if you do breed lambs, and I hope you do, because I can give a whole nother seminar on why you should be breeding your, uh, uh, exposing your ewe lambs to rams, but that's another time. Um, but really just to kind of give you is they really don't influence the overall mature flock curve, but you know, some years they all breed up right here and then lamb right there, other years like this one, it's kind of sporadic, but that just, that's just FYI and what you can expect from that, that first lambing crop. So the flow of this talk as we move forward, I'm gonna be, if, for the most of the time, I'll present the, the information in the order. We'll talk about infrastructure, then we'll move to equipment, and then we'll move, move to labor management and health and how all of those, those fit together. So the pregnant you will start here. Um, I, you should be seeing on your screen, this is just uh, uh, NAEP imagery of uh, satellite imagery of the U.S. Sheep Experiment Station working facility component. Yes, it's, it's, it's quite large, but like I said, don't let the size of this say, oh, this is not applicable to me, applicable to me because I only have 20 ewes. When we get into this, you'll see that this addresses uh, sheep flocks of all sizes. So what we have here is, is we have these two barns right here are our lambing barns. I'm hitting them with the red dot right there. And uh, as, as indicated here, these lots right here, we're just gonna focus on the lambing barns and these five lots right here. These are what we call our drop or our staging pens. 
And so the way that this would flow is, is that when we get towards the end of February, 1st of March, all of the sheep are trucked into this particular facility, and then they are divided according to when we expect them to lamb into various pens. And as they lamb, they are transitioned and moved to the lambing barns. So, so this will kind of begin our talk because we're talking about the pregnant ewes that are going to be sitting right here. So when we talk about um, the late pregnant ewe in terms of infrastructure and management, you know, obviously infrastructure, you're going to need several fenced areas. Where it could be a pasture, it could be a feedlot, but the thing is it needs to be in fluid proximity, if I can actually use that term, fluid proximity, I think that's the first time I've tried that one, uh, uh, with your lambing sheds. My, my, my meaning by that is, is that they're nearby and you can easily move, whether you're moving them by a cart that's pulled by an ATV or whether you are actually moving them through little alleyways that you set up and you're actually walking them to the lambing shed, it needs to be fluid. And I'm gonna talk about that, I'm gonna say that over and over again. Traffic jams between sheep and employees or employees, employees or sheep and sheep, that congestion uh, can spell a lot of inefficiencies and, and, and lead to some minor disasters in a shed lambing system. So fluid things, there has to be an exit, there has to be an entry point and those cannot collide. Also with your pens or pasture or what you're using, you're gonna need feeding areas or feed bunks. You're gonna need feed storage areas right near the facility. Um, you will outside, it's still, at least many of you, if you're lambing in late winter, um, you know, you still need outside protection for the uh, ewes that are still outside and, and uh, windbreaks, bedding areas, convenient uh, gates and uh, alleys. When I say convenient, that's talking about the fluid flow, being able to move animals to and from without congestion or, or jams. Night lighting, very important. Um, for the people that are doing the night watch, uh, you know, there's nothing worse than trying to manage this with the flashlight or, or hoping you had a full moon. Uh, lighting is, is very important and also good access to solid set waterers. So that, that's pretty much your infrastructure that goes into that. So we're going to zoom in again, a little bit better zoom. Here's my lambing barns again. Here's my drop pins. Now, my drop pins right here, these are the U's that would be the ones that I said that I exposed to the rams at the first. Okay, that, they're here. They're ready to ready to, to lamb. So I've got them close up. Staging pen, these are the ones that lack about seven days. And here with the larger flock, we it's best that we can stage them based on when we expect them to lamb. If you have a small flock, then, then maybe that's not as important because you're just really watching 10 to 20 head or, or 50 head and dividing them up in groups may not, uh, may not fit 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 your purpose. But also, again, you know, when you look at this, it's like, wow, that's, that's pretty sizable. But think about it, that if I just only had 50 head, I could take a quarter of this, something a quarter of the size of this barn, that's all I'd need. And this area right here would then become my little drop pins and my little staging areas. And so really, it's just a matter of magnitude on size, but everything is about the same in terms of convenience. So this little red line, basically what it shows is, is this is the path that our, um, what we call our drop pickers, the person that's assigned probably two to four times an hour, 24 hours around the clock or a group of persons, um, that they, we have a little cart that I'll show you in just a minute that's pulled behind a tractor and they drive through and all they're looking for are ewes that have dropped a lamb and they're immediately gonna load her up and bring her to one of the two lambing facilities. This area is open, free from obstruction. In fact, we don't have gates. We actually have uh, little cattle guards. I guess since we're talking about sheep, they'd be little sheep guards. But it's it's an ability for a person to go in and out of the pen without having to open a gate all the time, yet it holds the animals in their respective area. This is a picture. This is a north-facing picture of one of these drop lots where we hold the ewes that are pregnant about to lamb. Now, one of the things, it is north facing, so we expect the uh, storm to come from top down this way. But what I want you to notice, and, and you may, again, it, it looks huge, and it is a huge pen, but you, you have to just bring it in the, the picture into perspective of what size your operation is. But notice this, this right here is a windbreak, okay, so it's about 12 foot tall. Uh, we can bed the area, so it's a place for the animals to get out of the elements. Although this is a large pen, look at the proximity of the windbreak to the feed bunk, Here's the salt, here's the water. So you could have, this pen will hold 500 ewes, but 
basically 500 ewes can be here, be blocked uh, from the elements, but also be able to access their feed and water without much movement because you know, every one of you that, that has sheep or goats, you can realize that when you get a late pregnant goat or sheep, um, you know, they don't move too quick <laughs> and they do need minimal distance to access the nutrients they need to sustain, to sustain their cells. So this just kind of gives you an example of that layout. So let's talk about equipment, <coughs> excuse me, to service the, uh, the late pregnant ewe. Um, for us, okay, uh, larger operation, we have a feed mixer, a wagon, a feed uploaders to the bins. We have tractors, front end loaders or skid steers. Animal related, I talked about this uh, tractor pulling this cart. We call this a granny cart. Um, and I'll show you a picture of that. We, we load the, the ewes that just dropped the lamb in of something to bed with and also snow removal. I mean, all of us that are up in the area where it snows realizes that we can get an April storm in here that can drop 12 inches of snow with 60 mile an hour winds and all of a sudden our pins you know, have six foot snow drifts over them. And so we have to be able to remove that. You know, if you're a small operator, you know, sometimes just a hand driven snow blower gets the job done for us. We have a lot of acreage, so we have to use front end loaders and skid steers. But the same thing, I'm not saying that you need a tractor or a feed mixer. Again, if you're looking at 10 to 20 head, well, obviously equipment feed related would be a wheelbarrow that you could uh, move pellets to and from uh, your, your staging area and where your, your, or your feed storage area and where your lambing has occur, occurred. Um, but these, this just kind of gives you an idea in terms of equipment to support the late pregnant ewe. So these are just some pictures. So this is our feed mixer and then our skid steer and all the, obviously all of our, our feed storage areas. Talked about snow removal, you know, this old military surplus uh, front end loader and, a, and a, an old rickety truck, but it gets the job done. This right here is a, um, this, this is a type of hay feeder. You put the uh, four, by four, four by four by eight bales, which commonly referred to as the one ton bales, which they never weigh one ton, but you call them that. But this will hold too. And this was, used to be used for a um, just feeding. So it, it, it's got some knives on some auger flighting here and it ejects the feed out this side over here. But we don't use that anymore. This is actually was to be surplus many years ago, but Mark, our operations chief, was just like, hey, this would be a perfect bedding device. So we did a little bit of modification so we can put two of those large barley bales of barley straw on there and then pull through the area and just dump the bedding out into those, those big uh, uh, drop lot pins. So quite handy. Now this apparently it looks to be rickety and it's looks rickety, but it's certainly solid. But this is what we call the granny cart. And look at the functionality of this particular cart, despite, you know, it kind of looking a little bit old because it is old, but it works, is that we have, uh, we can hold one, two, three, four, five ewes in there. It's wide enough for large ewes because we do have large sheep here and their, um, and their offspring. So this is hooked onto a tractor. The drop picker drives out in the lot. He sees a ewe that drops, drops the lamb. He picks the lamb up, lays the lamb in there. The ewe drops up in here. But in terms of functionality, we have doors on both sides. So it really doesn't matter which way he pulls up near the lambing shed. There's always a door on either side that they can, they can uh, uh, take the animal out. So this just kind of gives you a little bit of idea of, of some of our base equipment in managing the pregnant, pregnant ewe. Now we're going to step back when we talk about health and management. We're actually going to talk about the pregnant ewe from early pregnancy real quick all the way to when she gives birth. And uh, these are some of the things that you need to think about if you have access to it. So I'm very pleased to see that the more and more I visit with producers in the industry that they do have availability of a of ultrasound for pregnancy checking. And if you have access to that, I encourage you to invest in it or to use it because you can go out about 40 to 60 days after breeding and then you can preg check your ewes and that you know, few percentage that winds up being open, you can sort those out because there are a number of reasons why we do that, even though it's just a few ewes, is one is they're gonna, they're competing for feed and they can make it to the bunks faster than the pregnant ewes and they eat feed that they really don't need and they're eating feed that I need my pregnant ewes are eating. So there's a cost savings in terms of feed. Also congestion. When we get closer and closer to lambing and you have a few open ewes out there, those open ewes kind of cause problems in terms of their attitude and their movement, they're running around, they cause congestion. Uh, again, you have the feed bunk issue of them beating their way to the feed bunk or, or actually pushing a pregnant ewe out of the feed bunk and competing against the feed resources. So it's nice early on if you can separate those, those uh, open ewes from your pregnant ewes. 
This is a big help kick here. About four to six weeks before lambing, we provide our booster shot for our clostridial organisms. Now, let's think about this and think about your shed lambing system or maybe one that you're going to invest in. The deal about shed lambing system versus obviously pasture and range lambing is, is we are concentrating a lot of animals in a very small area. And what happens when we concentrate animals? Well, I mean, look at the current pandemic issue. I mean, all of the, the regulations that the governors throughout the United States are implementing is, is no groups larger than 10 or larger than 50 people meeting together. Well, this is just based upon the common sense deal that when animals get close to each other, the likelihood that they can spread diseases from one uh, one uh, entity to the next increases greatly rather than being out on large open range or something like that. So we need to prepare our ewes and our lambs to hire, a, a to, to hire, we need to prepare our ewes and lambs to handle an environment where the likelihood of contracting a disease increases greatly. Okay, so, you know, beyond the viral, look at what a, a shed lambing system, remember how I defined it, it's a sheltered unit, so you have a warmer unit, it's a unit to where you concentrate animals, so you have a wetter unit, and we have a lot of bedding, and you have a lot of material, you have feces and urine being deposited, and you have the after components of birth being deposited there, even though they're left there shortly because you're going to clean that stuff out of the way, but still, you have an environment that's a great incubator for organisms, especially the clostridials. So you should have already given your ewes their primaries and secondaries six months earlier. And at this point, you are giving a booster because what you're going to do is it helps the ewe, but your focus is the clostrum. Because as the ewe responds to that booster vaccination, she is gonna develop the clostridial, the anti-clostridial anti -clostridial antibodies and that is gonna be concentrated in the first milk or the colostrum and those lambs need that desperately in order for them to survive in any normal environment, but especially a shed lambing environment where these organisms could increase or the concentration of these organ organisms can increase exponentially. Then as we get about two weeks before lambing, um, you know, this is the whole deal of the fluidity of the system that you are bringing these ewes up very close to your lambing sheds to, to be nearby and to facilitate the transfer of them in and out of those lambing buildings. Okay, so that, that kind of gets your health and management there. Um, let's go back to the uh, late pregnant ewe. So right there at the point of, of lambing in terms of your labor, and I put health in there too, because the people that are in charge, what we call drop pickers, and if you're a small enterprise, you yourself are going to fill all of these labor goals. But as the enterprise gets bigger, then we have helpers. And uh, your drop pickers, not only is it important for them to be able to get the ewes and lambs safely and in good condition to the lambing shed, but they're your ears, well, not really your ears, they're your eyes to tell you what's going on out into the, in, in the drop pit. Do we see abortions? Do we see toxemia? Do we see lame use? They're the ones that are gonna help you identify to get on top of potential disease disasters or health disasters before they get out of control. It's very important. And they're the ones that monitor for this. So the ones that identify those lame use, pull them out to separate pens so they can be treated, maybe toxemia. You're like, oh my goodness, we need to do maybe a, a diet adjustment there or the abortions, heaven forbid, when we start seeing the, the aborted uh, fetuses pile up, we know that we could have an, a wreck and what intervention do we need to implement at that time? Uh, so drop pickers are very important in terms of your labor uh, force. Your feeders, like I said, that if you're a small enterprise, that could be you too. But on larger enterprise, the feeder, not only um, uh, um, are they also your eyes outside, but also they're monitoring to make sure the animals are getting the feed that they require. Does it have sufficient energy? Does it have sufficient protein? Also, in, when we get to the lactating use, coccidiosis is going to be an issue for those lambs that are in those pens. And are they providing a coccidia stat like they should? Are their waters working? Are the waters clean? Do we have trace mineral salt available? All of these factors are going to affect how well your U performs um, throughout uh, lambing as well as getting into lactation. So very important when we, important when we look at the, the labor force here of the duties of the drop pickers and the feeders. So now let's talk about the birthing use. So I'm at the stage to where 
Um, we are coming out of the pens and we're going to be in these two buildings and we're uh, managing the use for a short period, uh, you know, 24 to 48 hours in these buildings and they go out to smaller pens here. So that, that'll be our target for this, this part of the discussion. So let's talk about infrastructure for the birthing ewe and the neonatal, neonatal lambs. Um, the shed, uh, well, the goal of the shed is to minimize the climatic factors. Remember, we're going to a sheltered environment and there are many, 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 many different types of sheds. The shed that was in the pictures, those are climate control facilities. We don't keep them all that warm. We just want to keep them above freezing. So we're trying to hold the shed temperatures between about mm, 40 degrees and 45 degrees. And so we do have injected heat uh, in there from propane fired furnaces. And then we do also have an air removal system uh, to remove ammonia buildup as well as dust and things like that and humidity. And we'll talk uh, about those later because those three right there can be an enemy with regard to um, uh, diseases um, or instigating or providing a good habitat for uh, pathogenic or, uh, uh, microorganisms. Um, so the size of your lambing facility is, you know, mostly based on the number of your jugs. Well, how do I go about calculating how many jugs I need? Well, again, that's going to be based on your lambing curve. How many ewes at my peak lambing do I expect to lamb in a single day? And also how long will I maintain them in my facility? Some people only maintain them from 12 to 24 hours, meaning that they are turning over open jugs on a 24 hour basis. We on the other hand can be up to 48 hours. So we're turning those jugs over once every two days. So I'm holding and not opening up jugs. So basically I will need twice as many available jugs if I'm holding for 48 hours versus one that is only holding them for a maximum of 24 hours. So those are just kind of some math that, that uh, a little bit of math that you need to think about in constructing your facility. Jugs, my opinion, and it's just not opinion. I mean, I think it really comes more down to fact as we look at the literature all over the world is, is that your standard U is gonna need about about 32 square feet. And so a nice square four by four pin works very well. So remember, the reason you're putting a shed lambing system in place is so you can give that increased husbandry and care. So not only do you need room for your you to move around, to hold your feeder, to hold your waterer, and also the lambs to interact in there, but you need room for you. You need to be able to get in there with the ewe and her lamb to help the lamb suckle, to make sure the ewe is in good condition and to clear her teats or whatever it may be because you are going to have your hands on that ewe and you're gonna have your hands on that lamb. Also, you may need to provide assistance to the, the ewe and birthing uh, you know, another, another lamb out of that ewe once she's moved into the shed. So you need to be able to work in there and they need to be able to freely move in there as well. Your flooring, your floor should be hard packed, but porous. Um, so most sh uh, sheds are straight on top of the ground. The ground is usually a, a, an aggregate base of, of a little bit of soil and maybe some small gravel. That helps, uh, that immediately will start packing down as soon as you get a little bit of moisture on there. So it makes it easy to scoop out. Also the urine and other moisture buildup condensate will be able to percolate down and away from the surface. Uh, a lot of people have concrete floors because they've modified a, an existing barn. That's fine too. It's just how you manage that and making sure that when you clean between views, and if I forget to say this again, I will argue with anybody on this phone call about if they say, well, you don't need to clean between views, just throw fresh bedding on top of the old. People, that defeats the whole purpose of trying to minimize uh, pathogen spread, uh, uh, pathogen spread among uh, the, uh, from ewes and the lambs. Those areas need to be cleaned between ewes, provided a little bit of time to dry, maybe throw a drying agent on the ground, a little bit of disinfectant between ewes. This is very, very important. Okay, so if I don't mention it again, just, just remember that. So that's kind of your infrastructure you're looking at. Also, again, think of flow through design. Gates should be able to be open nearly 180 degrees if you can. Like I said, you may already have a setup. If, you, if your setup doesn't accommodate this, I'm not scolding you or anything. I'm just saying if you have the chance to modify, um, if you're building something, try to construct it to where your gates can swing 180 degrees completely open. Make sure your latches are working. There is nothing more frustrating, and believe me, to walk into a lambing barn where the gates do not latch. You have ewes and lambs scattered all over the place, and it, it, it is just, it's a disaster. But anyway, 
alleyways, they need to be effective. When I say effective, that means, again, I'm going to bring up the word congestion, traffic jams, employees running into each other, um, and the employees may be you and your spouse, you and your spouse bumping into each other in a very frustrating landing day. That never works out good for morale. Um, but the thing is, is, is that you need to have exit points, entry points, alleyways wide enough that, that two people can pass each other or that you can move your equipment down. So really put a lot of thought into your alleys as well as your pins. Um, controlled mechanical or manual ventilation, sun panels. Um, if three-sided, you really don't need any ventilation because you have an open side, but make sure that that three-sided facility faces the sun. You're going to capture that solar energy. That's that's so important. That's so important. Um, you need a feed and bedding storage area that are nearby, so you don't have to drive a quarter of a mile to get that stuff. Uh, like I said, if you have a fully closed facility, heat and fans are important. And also, I have a vet medicine storage. It's Think about this. Like I said, if you haven't built one, think about it. If you're, if you're going to build an operation, then think about a, a room set aside for your medicine so you can keep that room relatively clean. It's got a sink. Uh, it's got hot water. You know, whether you put a hot water heater in there or one of those on-demand things, I, you know, everybody on this, this call that, uh, that manages sheep and goats, you know, you know what I'm talking about, that sometimes one of the best ingredients for a whole lambing enterprise is the ac immediate access to hot, hot water. Um, and those need to be nearby and right, right uh, uh, integrated with your, your lambing shed. So this is going to be a picture, uh, or these pictures here are, are what we would see, a in, at least in the upper mountain west, a very traditional, this is a very traditional lambing shed. Um, if you look at it, um, you know, that's just plywood that's just bolted onto a pole barn, and that's it. Uh, we have some uh, panels here, uh, they used to be five. Now, I think they're polycarbonate panels. They used to be fiberglass, but you've seen these on barns. So it allows us a chance to collect that solar heat. These little, where I got these arrows pointed right here, all the way down, these are vent ports, so air can go in. And then, of course, this is a closed facility to us, so we, uh, we pull the air and, and, and shoot it out the top of the building at these two ports right here. Notice I've got my silo. This silo actually has an auger that comes into the building and delivers a pelleted diet that we then take to, the, uh, to each pen. I have arrows right here. Now, we're going to talk about these little, why are these little pieces of pipe sticking out here? They're actually water drain systems, but I'll show you the significance of them in just a minute. And also, we have a good wide door, um, and uh, that will swing 180 degrees, and it allows two people to go opposite ways through the door without running into each other. Now, listen, the next picture, we're going to go right into this door. So stepping right into this door, this is what we're looking at. So here are all these little jugs all the way down, all the way at the length of the barn. This facility, as you can see by the number 90, it has 90 jugs. Um, little deals that we do that makes life interesting for us is, is that, you know, of course we're research, so this would fit us. Um, you know, we have clipboards for each pin. Somebody just think, well, that's no big deal. Well, when you need to put a note up there for somebody else to pay attention to, um, um, all the information about that animal can be captured right there. Not only do we have solar lighting coming through, but we also have, you know, um, our fluorescent lighting here. And uh, so this just kind of gives you a general idea. We use a dirt floor and we bed with straw. And like I said, we, we remove that straw and let that pin dry a little bit and disinfect that pin in between each U that goes uh, in and out. But like I said, this gives you a little bit of uh, view. Now I want you to notice down here, there's a gate that's wide open, okay? And you notice that gap between the gate and you may say, well, uh, you could squeeze right past there. True, but I want you to remember this picture, and I want you to remember, and I want to show you how that we uh, fix that fix that issue uh, uh, pretty easily. Um, this picture, just real quick. This is our heaters. I wanted to tell you that we had air injection heat, and um, um, also our ventilation. So, a lot of lamb uh, lambing sheds are built based on poultry barn. Uh, structures or ideas to where a lot of poultry barns, you you pull in air up high and you remove air up high. Well, in cold months, we really want to try to retain our heat because that's where our heat goes. And our animals are actually down at floor level. And so all of the ammonia and the humidity and dust that can lead to uh, diseases such as pneumonia, the number one killer in lambs, especially in shade lambing operations, is to remove the air from the bottom of the building instead of the top. So this 
right up here where I got my little dot, this is a, a, a ventilation tube. So air is being pulled through that. But we have pieces of PVC pipe that go all the way down to one foot off the floor. And I've got a better picture here in just a minute to demonstrate that to where we pull our air off the floor of the pen that we, we eject out of the facility rather than pulling the air up here. Okay, so just keep it, oh, and a clock. Yeah, you know, a clock, a clock with batteries, that's real important in the barn, especially for the people that are waiting to see what time they get off work. But um, anyway, so that just gives you an overall idea of what that looks like. Now, this is the other lambing facility. Um, this, uh, these jugs are a little bit easier to see. My pictures come out better, got a little bit more room to move in that particular building. But note a few things. Um, right here is that ventilation tube. It's one foot off the ground. So again, it's drawing the dust. It's drawing, it's drawing the air from where the, where the problem contaminants or particles are being developed. Your humidity, your ammonia from the urine, and also the dust from the straw. It's drawing it right at its source. Plus it's preserving heat higher up in the facility by not pulling the air off the top of the building. <clears throat> um, notice here's the gate. It swings 180 degrees. So this is in, in our little latching system. You can't quite see the latches, but they, but they work. Um, this kind of gives you an idea, again, our alleys, so nice and wide, two people can fit through, our carts delivering the pelleted feed, you know, can move freely and everything. This right here is actually an intersection, and uh, again, intersections can be disasters as far as congestion, but the way we manage, the way we manage moving a U into different parts of the facility, because you can see this facility goes quite a bit of ways to the left is we have these nice, so you didn't even see these gates in the other picture, let's go back. See these gates swing completely out of the way. There's a gate there and there's a gate, there's a gate on each four corner, but we can quickly swing those gates around to where they lock. And then we've got a barrier to where the U and, and the person moving the U and the lamb can move. Okay, so those are just kind of some little nifty quick fixes, low cost that help us uh, uh, maintain fluidity throughout, throughout the system. So let's come to the, let's talk about to some of the specific equipment that would be involved in our birthing use and then water. And the same, the reason I say fixed as possible is, is believe me, I'm, I'm not trying to scold or get onto anybody that puts a bucket in the bottom of the pen, but you know the disaster. Remember, the U is going to be moving around in that pen. You're going to be in that pen helping that U. And man, the worst thing is to have a two gallon bucket of water just spill and get everything wet and just create uh, just, a, just a nasty mess. And so if you can fix your buckets or have little bucket holders or fix your waters, and I'll, I'll go into the, our water real quick, um, how it's fixed permanently. Um, that's, that's really a nice, a nice added benefit, really makes things uh, and keeps the humidity down plus the mucky mess of, of a bucket spilling. Feed containers, compact and also fixed as possible. Again, the same thing, it's, a, you know, it's just such a waste of feed when that bucket of feed just spills over. You can, if you can get it a little bit more compact and out of the way and fixed if possible, that's much better. But you're going to need wheeled carts, you know, wheel, wheelbarrows, pitchforks, shovels, temporary barricades or aisle curtains. I'll show you how we're going to fix that gate gap that we saw in the other barn in just a minute. And then also you just always got to have a pickup, an ATV, a tractor, because you got to haul stuff in and out. And so that's just some of the equipment that you'll need uh, handy in a uh, shed lambing enterprise. So this picture right here goes back to the, the other barn. And right here, this is our water. So all this is, this is a six inch um, or five inch, excuse me, uh, PVC. And it runs the length of this, this set of lambing units, one for each side of the jugs. It's perfectly level. So it did take time in cutting these gaps to make sure we could install it level. But not only is it level, it's fixed. And for each jug, there's a little port it's been cut through and the edge is rounded so there's no sharp edges on that PVC that the U can access. So basically each day the uh, person managing the shed gets in there and then they just look at the water level and they just turn the valve on and add water to it. But these are high enough that the U can't defecate in it, but every once in a while we have a long-legged U that, that can back up against and defecate in that. And so we can pull plugs down here and drain that, that water out. So that other building where I showed you those ports coming out of that building, that just simply drains, drains out on the ground. So like I said, wheeled carts, other wheel type carts, an area to store, uh, we store uh, bedding hay here, but also our scoops for our feed and our, our um, pitchforks. But I want you to notice these things right here. It's canvas wrapped around a two by two piece of wood. What in the world would I use that for? 
that can be unrolled, laid across the gates, and that's what blocks that barrier off where that gate doesn't swing all the way across and to keep that U from running past, well, I just drop that and that stops them and they run right into the pin. So that's just, again, just this quick, cheap fix to make a, a barrier that can be stored easily and handled uh, by anybody, no matter what their skill level. Um, so yeah, that's just another picture of that. Also, don't forget about, yeah, you need something to warm those lambs. Again, it's a shed lambing system. Animals are up close. You may not have a warming room out on the open range lambing, but again, it's all about increasing probability of survival. And uh, so this is just a box that's got a port in the back, a little space heater sits on the ground back here that just blows warm air in there to work connects it out the top. But we can take a lamb that's chilled down, that's just about on the verge of death because of hypothermia, but we can drop them in this box for a few minutes and dry them off and bring that temperature up pretty quick. Uh, management and health. Remember, we'll just go, this is, uh, we've got over the infrastructure and uh, um, uh, equipment list. Let's jump into management and health. Uh, again, use drop outside, but you must immediately transfer them to the shed. That's the whole purpose of having the shed is to no longer leave them in that environment outside, but to get them in. And that's critical to the health of the lamb. Um, also, you have the, the use up close so you can get in there, provide uh, assistance for lambing difficulties and then treat them accordingly after that. Um, also, we're right there with the lamb. So we're going to have the labor invested. We're going to immediately check for thrift and, and provide suckling assistance. We're going to treat the navels, ensure first consumption of first milk, the colostrum, and supplement that if we need. Um, also, this is where we make our graft and orphaning decisions. That's also the advantage of a shed lambing system is you can really capitalize on the graft. You have a bunch of recipient use up close and you can make sure that you can avoid this word, orphaning. I'm not going to go into that. That's a whole nother talk. Um, but uh, you can make those decisions right there. And also within the first 12 hours is when we check the use thoroughly and the lambs for all health issues. Make sure we get those records recorded and make sure those treatments are done accordingly. And also we do castrate and uh, band uh, tails at, at birth. Your labor, this person, we call them the suckle and graft crew. They are probably the hardest working and most important of the entire shed lambing enterprise. They are responsible for immediate lamb care and assisting ewes with births, also assisting lambs with nursing, treating the navels, and then treating in the navels and also making the graft decisions. But they're the ones that are in the pen with the ewe helping both the ewe and the lamb. And that is the core labor component of the shed lambing system. If you fail here, the whole system comes apart and it, and it wasn't really worth the time. Also, you have people, labor that's responsible for making sure the ewes and lambs are ready to go and get them on out the shed. Also, they can also be assigned uh, some of the responsibilities of suckling graft. And also you just got the general maintenance. We're cleaning between ewes. I've already, this is the third time I've said that. You've got to clean between ewes. You've got to prep and make that pen suitable and reduce the likelihood that you're growing a microbial mess in the bottom of that pen. Keep those waters clean. Keep that never let a ewe lack for feed, uh, a lactating ewe and restock the supplies and assist others with duties. So these are kind of three separate jobs. Again, if it's a small operation, you probably do them all, but a larger operation, you may have people set aside for that. So this is Taylor Hudson. She was one of our top uh, suckle and graft people several years back and just some pictures of her down there. And that's what she's doing. She's, uh, you know, stripping those teats, getting it ready for this newborn lamb to be able to get up there and, and, and nurse and provide assistance if needed. Um, I'm not going to talk about that lamb, kind of a genetically one, <laughs> almost looks like a catastrophe, but we get those oddballs that pop up every now and then. Um, we're not going to talk about orphan lambs. You want to avoid orphaning as much as possible, but just realize you have, you are going to have orphans, so you have to have an exit plan for orphans, okay? That's another talk that I can do at a later time if, if uh, Dr. Ellison invites me. But overall, shed lambing schedule and assignments are the top priorities. It's about flow, people. It's about flow for your animals and the physical structure. It's about flow and your employees or you, everybody knowing their job and taking care of it when it needs to be taken care of. If a lamb needs to have assistance in suckling, it needs to be done as soon as they need assistance, not an hour, hour later. Again, it's all about increasing probability that, that lamb will survive. So the lactating you, um, and we'll speed through this pretty quick because I'm starting to get on, on, on a little bit uh, long here, 
is now we're at the point that we're coming out of the sheds, we're going back into these lots and we're gonna hold them at our operation for about 35 days before the pasture over here is green enough to turn them out. Um, you know, equipment wise and infrastructure, again, just like the pregnant you, you're gonna have to have pens, you need to be have lamb shelters in the pens so that they can be sheltered from the, the, uh, the, the elements. Also, if you're gonna have creep feeders, you have to have systems set up there. Um, um, we like to short our use, sort our use according to their prolificacy. So all the twinning use are fed separately from the single use. You don't have to do this, but the larger the operation you are, the more you need to pay attention to this. Um, and the feeding infrastructure is the same as it was for the pregnant you. In terms of health, this is where that set of employees, which again, if you're a small enterprise, it may be you, but this is when you're out there doing daily, constant daily monitoring. You're looking at those pregnant ewes, you're looking for mastitis, other, other, other health problems. You're looking for lameness in the ewes and the lambs. You're looking for ill thrift, poor doers. You're looking for the onset of coccidiosis, enterotoxemia, navel ill, castrating, docking issues. You're out there every day monitoring constantly for this. This is a component of the shed lambing enterprise. It's actually providing those husbandry practices that you normally maybe wouldn't provide in a more open and hands-off environment. Uh, maintenance of pen and pasture quality. If it's snowing, raining, you got muddy areas, you've got to create dry areas. So you got to maintain those pens and always proper nutrition and proper water. And so here's a crew out here uh, treating, a, treating a lamb for what? I don't know, but they are certainly intent on treating it. As far as equipment, uh, one person, a veterinarian we actually contract, she talks about the vet box. She said that's her most important tool. Well, your vet box is basically, it's a fish and tackle box full of those things that are most commonly needed when she's out there treating, just to avoid having to go back and forth, back and forth to the vet shed. She has it with her and she gets things taken care of. Again, creep feeding, you need to have restricted access for your lambs only because your ewes will eat up all your creep feed in about five minutes. So keep that up to date and all the other equipment is described as for the pregnant you. So here's a little shelter that we may use for um, uh, the lambs, uh, just a few depending on the, the shelter side will depend on how many lambs you have in here. Here's one of the things that we use for the creep feeders. Um, but anyway, that uh, just to get over and wrap this up, then once we're here, then once we've got those lambs old enough and we got green grass and everything starts being collected and moved out to range. So final considerations. Now, people make no doubt, of, there's no doubt about this. A shed lambing system will increase infrastructure and equipment cost, burden of feed and labor, risk of disease, fuel and energy costs. But it's how you manage this. You're like, well, why would I want to go here if all that's going to cost me like that? It's a good investment, but it's how you manage that and how you implement that because shed lambing must and it will increase lamb survival and total weight of lamb wean. And the trick is, is to get more weight of lamb sold to make it all worthwhile. So um, one other thing to remember, maybe two, shed lambing is just one piece of an entire enterprise. So like I said, be careful not to put too much focus on it. Make sure it integrates well with your enterprise 365 days a year. And shed lambing design and operation must flow smoothly. In other words, design and manage uh, you need to design and manage to minimize traffic jams among sheep and employees. So with that, Dr. Stewart, I'll, I will turn it back over to you. Excellent, Brett. That was extremely informative. I think the design principles, everything to the management has application um, to, to each operation participating. There's a couple of questions um, previously that, that uh, I just wanted to get to, and I apologize, I'm gonna to have to scroll through this, so just bear with me. Thinking about scaling this back to a small flock, Brett, I think something that was mentioned is um, every 20 minutes around the clock, again, we're reiterating that this is a research facility, so SOPs require this continuity and maybe a little bit more labor than, than maybe a commercial enterprise. So the question was this, um, most small flocks have off the farm jobs and need to sleep. Can you discuss how they can best manage this? No, that's, that's a great question. I really appreciate the question because like I said, this talk does apply to everybody, but you know, I did give it to you from the perspective of, of a larger operation. I have to use an example of a couple, I won't share their name because I didn't ask permission, but a couple out of, uh, out of Montana that actually has a, a relatively sizable flock, but it's just a husband and wife. They don't have any other employees. 
uh, the wife does have another job and the, and the husband, in addition to their lambing enterprise, they also have cows. And so they have a lot going on. Um, basically, yes, they are not out there every 20 minutes. Um, uh, and, uh, but they're timing out there. They can, they can juggle around with each other, going out there, making sure they're maybe checking in hour intervals. And also, um, one thing that they did is, is they just went ahead and installed a, um, um, and, and it was relatively affordable little camera facility out there because again, they're, they're, although they have a decent number of views, their breeding allows them to have a relatively small three-sided, it's an open-sided structure. So they're not having to deal with all the equipment I was talking about for a closed facility, but it's a relatively small facility, very concentrated to where the camera can scan across. And not only is the camera picking up visual, it's also picking up sound. I remember the wife talking about that, you know, they're not going to stay up all night. They go and climb in bed and they'll have that on in, it's just like a baby monitor. And basically they'll hear a noise that they're like, yep, that's a you going or a fresh lamb has hit the ground, you know, hit the ground. And basically I think they wake up at two in the morning, flip a coin and see, you know, see who draws a straw of going out there. Um, so there's a lot of creative deals. And, and I don't mean to, 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 to increase your labor load by saying, by golly, you got to be out there every 15 to 20 minutes. But remember that example I gave um, was also, they're checking a thousand views or, or 1500 views the people are. So really about every 30 minutes, they're just constantly, because that's a lot of animals to check. But the smaller your operation is, that interval of checking can get quite spaced out because the likelihood that you're gonna have a you dropping a lamb every five minutes is, is, is pretty rare. They may, you may be lambing, you know, every six or seven hours, you may have a you come up and lamb. Brett, question. You know, if there's a lamb that's latent to, to really get on the teat and nurse, uh, at what point do you just say, I've got to get colostrum in this lamb and get it tubed, you know, with an esophageal feeder? What, what is your kind of uh, criteria there? No, that's uh, the criteria is I, I can't express enough the immediacy of that. I mean, you, the, the people out there, you, you've seen lambs or kids hit the ground. And uh, when they do hit the ground, I mean, you can see that bigger and, and, and that vigor needs to be pretty, pretty, pretty immediate. So like when you're coming back an hour later, you know, they need to be active. They need to be seeking. They may not be able to find the target yet, but if you see them up there seeking around, you know, it may be nothing more than kind of leaning over the edge of the pen and just guiding them right in and getting them right on it. But if you see those ones that they just continually to fail to get up and you'll see that you, that you will be nudging them. A good you will be over there licking it. She'll be nudging it. And if that lamb is slow to, slow to, to get up on their feet, you need to be in there. And the, really the, they need those fluids quick. Not only do they need the colostrum, but they need the hydration. Uh, they, they need the water also that's in that colostrum milk mix, that first milk, to hydrate them. And letting them go six or seven hours, I, sometimes I don't even know if some of them make it. They really need to be on that uh, uh, pretty quick. So that's one of those things that, like I said, I'm not trying to give you indication to increase your labor, labor load, but that lamb on the ground, that is your paycheck. And so that colostrum is so important and uh, a lot of times they say if a lamb doesn't get its colostrum in the first 12 hours, it's no good. And that's, that's really when the biological me mechanism fails to, to have that passive transfer. But think about hydration, people. That, that, lamb, that lamb needs to drink pretty early on. It needs to get up and get going. Excellent. Brett, we're getting overwhelmed with questions just because we have so many participants today. This was an excellent talk. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask those that are submitting questions to the chat box that that if we do not get to your question, please send us an email and we will do our best yeah. to answer those. Um, one question that, that uh, came, came up is, you know, the, the water management and keeping the water away from the sheds and where those animals are, how often do you have to go and regrade some of those pens or those areas close to uh, where those neonatal lambs are to keep standing water from occurring too much? How do you guys yeah. know? Oh, boy, that's just, a, okay, one thing fortunate, we do have a little bit of terrain to our pens. I mean, we're not a, we're not a flat area like if you're over in Kansas or something to where everything's flat. Um, we have a little bit of terrain, we have relatively poor soils, um, but still a lot of times the ground is still frozen. So it doesn't take but like a small combination of a sleet, rain, snow blasting in March to where all of a sudden we got water standing everywhere. We do get out there and sometimes we have to bust ice jams to get water to flow out, but we do have high points in our pens. So we do make the extra effort if we really get into a bad, mucky, nasty situation where we gotta keep those lambs dry even though they're back outside to where we'll find the high point of the area and we may do a little bit of extra bedding. We just use barley straw 
You know, that's the cheapest thing around the country. And we'll bed that and they'll hit it maybe once a day if it's like super wet and super nasty. But if 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 we have that event that kind of starts drying off, then they may not have to to upgrade that uh, that straw. But that's the way that's the way we manage it. But you can't have you you just can't limit your animals just to a standing water mucky area. They have got to be able to find high ground somewhere. Mm -hmm. Good, great points. So there are a couple of comments. I'm synthesizing these, Brad. And again, I apologize. It's a little different than the, our typical formats here. Um, they have, there's been a couple of people asked, do you have additional plans on your ventilation and watering system that could be shared at any point? I mean, we could work with you on if those are available. Yeah. If not, we'll just post this presentation. And Yeah, so, so here's what the deal. Just like Witt said a while ago, many of you that if we don't get to your questions or comments, please just take the time to copy that and paste it in an email, send it to Witt or Melinda, <clears throat> three of us will work together to formulate the answers. But also, yes, we can, it used to, I'd just tell people, well, come on out and I'll show you, but you know, we, we just can't do that anymore. But yes, I, I can uh, take the time, you have to give me a, a week or two, but I can put together the exact design and draw it, visit with you one-on-one -on, -one on the phone. Um, uh, in fact, heck, we could do a FaceTime, I could go out there and I could give you the measurements, but then try to hold that, that, that iPhone right where, Right where you can see what I'm talking about, but I will work with you on that. Yeah, just just get the information to me and say, hey, let me have it. And FYI, we didn't agree to this earlier that we would put you through this amount of work, Brett, so we appreciate it. Again, we uh, try to take care of our collaborators, so uh, that's good. Um, I think just, just for time, I think we're going to wrap it up. If Melinda has any objections, go ahead and interject, but um, uh, we really, really appreciate it. Uh, would highlight again that this is a research facility, but the principles presented uh, from the husbandry to this facility design can all be scaled and adapted, right? It, but it is contingent on you participants, you folks that are, are on your operation day in and day out. You have those insights to see what would work uh, most efficiently and what, what may be harder to implement. But I think uh, this is a working classroom, and I would just thank you again, Brett, for all your contributions, especially today. Uh, this is extremely valuable, and we wish everyone a good lambing season. Oh yeah, thank you very much, everybody, for attending. I mean, like I said, um, um, you can you can reach me. Uh, my email's out there on the website, but also you can uh, contact Melinda or Wit. And uh, Melinda, Wit, and I we all work together in terms of research and answering producer questions all the time. So we we love that interaction, and so please take advantage of it because technically. That's what we're here for, y'all's tax dollars that are paying all of these research and extension programs, and, and we've got to deliver that back to you as a product that will help you uh, uh, proceed forward in the manner that you need to. So thank you again. Again, if you have questions, and we encourage you to revisit that. Everyone have a great rest of your day, and we'll look forward to seeing you next week.